All right, well, let's get out our Bibles. And we were in uh, 1 Corinthians going verse by verse through this book. And we are in chapter 4 this morning. And we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. Anything else I need to cover before I can do what I do? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And let's read. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will, bring, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Father, breathe on our service today. Speak through me, Lord. Open hearts, O God, and lives, and tear down the hindrances, Lord God, in our hearts from serving you will. Forgive our sins and our bitterness, Lord, and our grudges and our selfishness. And help us, Lord God, to truly live out of our heart for you. And give us the freedom, Lord, and the liberty to do that, Father, I pray. As you have delivered us from the power of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of your love. We are no longer slaves to it, but to you. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just quickly over to James chapter 3. James says in chapter 3, verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. And if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And James here makes a distinction between genuine godly wisdom and the counterfeit wisdom of this world that is uh, earthly, he says, sensual and demonic. There is a wisdom of sorts that does not come from God, but it is earthly, meaning it's temporal. It's a wisdom that says, get it while it's hot, immediate gratification. It's a carrot stick right in front of you. It's for nearsighted people who don't look down the road and see the effects of their uh, covetousness. This wisdom is not only earthly, but it's sensual. It's driven by uh, sensual desires, selfishness, selfish desires. Uh, and it's demonic, meaning when we say something's demonic, it means that it, it's in competition with God for God's place. It seeks self-worship. It seeks to be validated and, and uh, to be worshipped by others. That's the wisdom of this world. It's a self-seeking kind of a wisdom. And it's driven by envy. But the wisdom that comes from God is peaceable and it's gentle and it's willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And Paul in 1 Corinthians is dealing with a bunch of Christians who should have grown up by now. But are still, as he says in chapter 3, babes in Christ. And Paul planted this church. It took him a year and a half to plant the church. And then he left and he turned it over to Apollos to become the next pastor of this church. And this is all in Acts chapter 18. You can read about it. And he says, you know, it was great that y'all were saved and that y'all were young in the faith when I left. But some time has passed now. And you should have grown up a little bit by now. And he says, you're still babes. Uh, your, your growth has been stunted at some level and, and you're selfish and you're not applying the word of God rightly. And he goes into detail about this and 
And uh, he says there's a lot of division in the church. How many of you know we don't need a lot of silly division in the church this year? Um, And he's asking for unity in the church. And he says usually when there's division in the church, it's over silly matters. But there are people that are not mature and they can't handle it well. And they are selfish and their feelings have been hurt. And... That stuff comes in and causes trouble in the church, and he's asking for them to grow up. Um, And when you are young in the faith, or when you kind of are a mixture of the church and the world, you start bringing ideas of the world into the church as to what is successful, as to what success looks like. And here, Paul's going to basically say success for a minister is in one word, faithfulness. That's it. He, he's going to say, uh, who is Paul and who is Apollos, but just servants through whom you have believed. Paul's going to say, I was basically a farmer. I sowed a little bit, but God gave all the increase. It was God who did all of this and not me. But the world will come in and they'll say, uh, wisdom looks like this. And philosophy looks like this in the world and in the business world or in Uh, the way things look out there. And so we need to bring that into the church. And so uh, man's wisdom is elevated sometimes over the Bible in churches of the way things should be done or taught. I would say today there is a very big famine in the church today when it comes to just Bible teaching. There's a lot of fluff, there's a bunch of gimmicks, there's a bunch of switch and bait to get people in the doors and entertainment. But when it comes to just teaching the Word of God, it's extremely rare because it steps on toes. Now there are some preachers, the Bible says, that uses the Word of God deceitfully. They'll preach a tailor-made gospel that doesn't have to do with judgment, doesn't have to do with sin, doesn't have to do with eternity in heaven or hell. Very unpopular topics in today's society that seek to revolve around you and how you would have things. And Paul says that, pl- that stuff has no place in the church. Selfish ambition has no place in the church. Egocentric religion has no place in the church. And he says, also, not only is the elevation of self a big deal, bringing that stuff into the church, but uh, and selfishness and immaturity, basically, but also uh, the elevation of men and women in the church, where we elevate them more than we should. Uh, Verse six of this verse, I don't think I read it. Now these things, brethren, I, I say figuratively, transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn not to think beyond what is written. About us. Basically, uh, you don't need to elevate people in the church above what is written about them in the Bible. And so we have heroes and superstars in the church. But I just want to say this. It's all team Jesus. We're, we're all to be team, a part of a team. And there should be no bunch of people coming in with agendas to celebrate themselves and see who does. We, we're all a part of a body, and there's one superstar, and that's Jesus. He is the light of the world, and, and we're all here to behold Him, okay? But Paul, and Paul's going to say, did, did I? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, no, Jesus died for the church. Jesus laid His life down for the church. And so all the gifts that you may have, and giftedness that you may have, is here to serve Him. And is, in a sense, to, put a, to sit in the back seat and let Jesus drive the car when it comes to the church. So just by introduction, the first part of this book deals with character issues. That's what we're dealing with. And then the last part of this book deals with the gifts of the Spirit and that we're to do things in love. But the world is full of gifts. The world is full of great singers. The world is full of great preachers. Revelation chapter 13 says that the devil himself 
will give the Antichrist a mouth to speak. The Antichrist is going to be able to blow people away with his uh, whatever. With his, with his mouth. Yeah, his or, oration or whatever you call it, okay? He, he's going to be like better than me at talking, all right? And tell you stories that make you laugh. And oh my gosh, this guy's so charismatic. You've got to get a hold of this guy. And the Bible is going to say, that's all out in the world. And if you think that that's what makes somebody spiritual in the church, their giftedness, you can get all that stuff on YouTube. You can get all that stuff on TikTok. But when you come into the church, what makes a person holy is their private life and their character and their devotion. Not necessarily their gift. I have a pastor friend right now who's very close to some people in this church that has pastored 27 years in a certain pulpit. 27 years and he pioneered the church. And now he's retiring. And he's passing it on. But there's some Yahoo uh, prophet that showed up in this church and told everybody how gifted he was, and he's risen up a, a coup against this pastor based upon his gifts. Gifts do not trump character. And if you don't have character, your gifts are going to miserably fail with you. And so I think it's very important that we study how to be faithful. How many of you don't need a gifted husband as much as you need a faithful one? Oh, he runs all over town on me, but boy, he sure can talk. And as much as I want people to feel forgiven in this church, feel accepted in this church, there has to be a level of stability that comes through people that are devoted and faithful. And, and I want to say this, the higher up the, I'll just say this, the higher you go up the ring of leadership in church, the harder it is to live. And Paul's going to deal with this today. He says, you want my job? You've got to put some things down in order to be used by God. And he's going to talk about having a holy focus. I'm going to give you three points today, three marks uh, of a minister, a genuine minister. And again, again, by way of introduction, just quickly, um, he, he, is, he is assuming here in this passage that these ministers are godly. In other passages, he deals with false ministers who handle the word of God deceitfully, who have a private agenda, who live immorally. And he's not talking about those ministers. But there are times when God gives us godly ministers who have a track record and they're faithful. They're faithful to their families. They're faithful to the pulpit and they're faithful to God's word. And stuff still pops up in church that is not right. And that's what he's addressing here. That stuff has to stop. OK, so let's look at this for a few minutes today. Uh, chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse one, he says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mis mysteries of God. Number one, uh, He's going to say, consider us, Paul and Apollos and Cephas, consider our identity when you consider us. We are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Let a man so consider us. In the Greek, it is hutos in this way or in this state in which we find ourselves. Let a man... Logizomai, consider us. The word logizomai, I love this word. Um, for those of you who know the word a little bit, over in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible says that we are re to reckon ourselves dead to the world. That word reckon is logizomai. And it is an accounting word. Go to the bank and find out what's in there kind of thing. It's a, an accounting word. But logizomai is also used for reasoning. It is used in uh, Galatians 3, 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to him. But it's logizomai, which also means to, to reason to a definite conclusion. It's used over in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, my brother, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, 
of virtue, of any praise at all. Logizomai, meditate on these things. Dwell on it. And what I want to bring out here just as a side note is when we say let a man consider us, let him dwell on these things about us. Let him reason that this is who we really are. But this word logizomai, when it's talking about God reckoning to Abraham righteousness for his faith, in the book of James, James adds this sentence, and Abraham was a friend of God. That God didn't just give Abraham some righteousness one day and said, I'll see you next week and see if you still have, the, have it. But this is the way God thought about Abraham from then on. That's my friend. It's how God dwelt on Abraham when he thought about him. It's how God saw him, perceived him. Let me be thankful today that God, when He saved you, He hasn't changed His mind. He didn't just accredit something to you like a, some kind of accrediting term, but this is how He reasons about you as your Father. That you are friend of God. And He's for you. Paul's going to say, don't let a bunch of hypercritical people get a hold of you. So he's going to talk about here. Because God sees His church a certain way. He didn't just send His Son to die for you. Your life hasn't just been bought by the blood of Jesus. But you are valuable to God and His perception of you is a certain way forever. Amen. While you're growing up, He sees you one way. And what are you? You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're His very best. You are the joy set before Christ when He died on the cross. You are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. And you are more than a conqueror because of who your Father is. And that's how God sees you. And even when Abraham got in trouble, because how many of you know he got into some mischief, God would come bail him out and say, don't mess with my prophet. He is my friend. Let me be thankful that God's have had your back even when you were a rascal. It's covenant. You may not always keep up your side of the bargain, but God is a covenant keeping God. And great is His faithfulness and He is Father for a reason. Somebody say amen. And that's the truth. I want you to know that God logizomized you. He meditates on you this way. Praise God. And in that sense, he says here, let a man dwell on this about us. Consider us. This is how a man should consider us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now this word servant in the Greek doesn't carry out in the English well enough. There is the word servant here in the New King James. It's minister in other translations. Servant is better than minister. Uh, but diakonos is usually used for servant. And then you have doulos, which is for slave or bond slave. But this is the bottom rung of the latter word for servant. Huperetes. And it is hupe, huper, uh, meaning under. And aroso, meaning to row. And literally it is the word for those that are galley slaves on a ship that row at the bottom level of the ship. Where nobody can see them, they're down there and they're just rowing. Have you ever seen those movies where they're, or, where they're rowing and if they stop, somebody hit them on the back? Paul says, if you want my job, consider us this. We are galley slaves of Christ. You want to be at the top? You've got to learn how to be at the very bottom. And this word is first used in Luke chapter 1 verse 2. When Luke is writing, he says, Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers or galley slaves of the word who delivered them to us, delivered what they saw to us. This word is used in conjunction with the ministry of the word. That we are to be slaves of Christ. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must learn how to be a slave. 
And not just somebody who is a slave, but somebody who is in deep labor for little reward. There are a lot of people with ambition in the church. They think, man, if I get to a certain level, I'll be saying They have no idea of the hits that come all week long. Let's look at what Paul says about the hits that come. Over in uh, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, he kind of speaks of being a galley slave of God here in verse 4. He says, But in all things we commend ourselves as galley slaves of God, huperites of God, ministers of God, in much patience, in much tribulation and needs and distresses and stripes, in imprisonments and tumults and labors and sleeplessness. Have you ever lost sleep praying for people? In fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand, on the left, by honor and dishonor. There are people that love you. There are people that don't. By evil report, by good report. People, some people say we're deceivers and yet we're true. We're not very much known and yet we're well known. As dying and behold we live as chastened by God at times. Yet not killed. As sorrowful but always rejoicing. As poor and yet making many rich and as having nothing but possessing all things. This is what a galley slave looks like. And yet we have the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the provision of God to do what God's called us to do. But there's a lot of pain. And you better know that you're called to the ministry. Whoever wants my job, glory to God. This passage is more for me today than I may be. It is for others. I don't know. But I see this very important in, in my job description. John, you signed up to serve. For no reward. And if you want longevity in your ministry, you can't do it as unto people, but as unto Christ. And it's got to be for Him. Because if you love Him with all your heart, you're going to be good business for your friends. If you will live to serve Christ and not the praise of people and to be seen by people. But just to sign up to say, Lord, I'm your slave. In Acts 26, 16, Jesus meets Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and he knocks Paul off of his donkey, right? And a great light shone around Paul as he's going to murder Christians. And Jesus arrests him there and says, rise and stand on your feet. For I've appeared to you for this purpose to make you a galley slave, a minister. It's the same word. And a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. You're on my payroll now, boy. You thought you're going to go kill a bunch of my people. And now I appeared to you for this purpose to make you a galley slave. And a witness of the things you have seen. Well, I'm really feeding somebody today. You're like, I came to the wrong church. There's nothing uh, warm that I'm feeling right now about who I am. And a witness of the things you've seen and the things I'll reveal to you. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Well, I'll turn there. Paul says in chapter 9, verse 16. Paul says, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. And how many of you know necessity was laid upon him on the Damascus road? How many of you go to a job because necessity is laid upon you to work and to make money so that you can feed your family? How many of you know that's true? And he says here, if I preach the gospel, I, I'm not boasting in it. Necessity was put upon me. And woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. What is he saying? If I do really good, I don't get any rewards for it. And if I mess up, that's when I get in trouble and I get punished by God. Woe to me if I don't preach this gospel. Some people go, oh, John, you've been preaching in this pulpit for 13 years. 
you have such longevity. Part of me is like, man, I know that I'm no good to anybody, including myself, if I'm doing anything but this right here. And woe to me if I go up, wander off someplace. God's going to find me and it won't be happy. For if I do it willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I've been entrusted a stewardship. Something God has put on my life, a, a stewardship. So you be faithful here. Verse 18, what is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. He says, my reward as being a minister of the gospel, if I'm just a slave, what is my reward? Here's my reward. That I'm more of a blessing than a burden to the body of Christ. At the end of the day, I can look at my life and say, I did not burden the church with sin or some other selfish issue in my life, but I was an absolute blessing to them. That's what I get out of it. How many of you, when you get to heaven, you want to hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. I think it's going to be shocking for some of you when you get there in the presence of Jesus Christ. And you've been tripped up about somebody not recognizing you or hurting your feelings in church. And it had nothing. And on that day, it's going to be you and Him. How many of you know this year, if we're going to serve God well, we've got to do it unto Him alone and not because we're here to be seen by others or to receive praise from anybody else. If you want the big times, you better put some things down and just become a slave. A servant. Get in there and row. There's a bunch of your teammates down there in the bottom. Well, who's looking? Who's... You've got to put that ambition to death. That wisdom does not belong in the church. Ambition does not belong in the church. The only thing that compels us is gratitude and love. And if you've been around some mean Christians, I want to apologize to you. Because there are people that come in the church because they think this is the place that they can be morally superior to others. And I'm telling you right now, you're nothing but dirt breathed upon. There ain't nothing good about you apart from what God has done in your life. And we're here to give Him all the praise for any good He's done in us. Amen? And you take the rest of that garbage out the back door. Amen. Glory to God. Line your bird cages with it. What else about our identity as ministers? What do you need to know? You need to know that those who are in leadership in the church are servants of Christ and they are stewards of the mysteries of God. They are stewards. The word steward is oikonomos. It's a manager of a household. It's overseer, superintendent. How many of you know there are stewards? Well, not anymore. They're flight attendants. But they used to have stewards and stewardesses in airplanes, right? And what would they do? They would serve you peanuts and drinks and tell you how to stay safe. But how many of you know the stewards and stewardesses of the airplane did not own the airplane? Neither were they driving it. Right? They were just serving. They were passing out what they had been given. And what is the job of a preacher? He is to be a slave in the house of God for Christ's sake, minister to the needs of the people, do unto the least of these, be happy with little things that nobody knows until God gives him more. And he's also to be a steward of the mysteries of God. What are the mysteries of God? A mystery is something that was hidden that is now revealed. And Paul talks about that in chapter 2. A mystery has to do with the doctrines of our faith and the things that have to do with the New Testament. Namely, the Word of God. That I am to steward the Word of God on Sunday mornings and what was put together in the kitchen gets to your table the same as it was made in the kitchen. And all I do is steward it on Sunday mornings. That's what I'm called to do. I'm not called to be creative. 
I'm not called to be wow and novel. I'm called, and some people call this Bible archaic, I call it timeless. It's been proven for 2,000 years until somebody who's 20 years old showed up and, decided, and said, I'm the new thing here, folks. Let me just put all that to the side. Forget you. You and your gifts. You know? We stick with the Word of God. And I don't want anything else. And sometimes people, man, they pull on me. And it's okay if you pull on me. I, I want you to. But I don't ever want the tail wagging the dog where I'm so busy ministering to people during the week that I have no time to study. I have no time to prepare because I am a steward of the mysteries of God. I have to, and, I, and uh, this word slave is in conjunction with the word of God. What's another good scripture I got for you? Uh, Colossians, this, this paints a better picture. Colossians chapter 1. He says here, um, chapter 1, verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations but now has been revealed to His saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I am to steward the mysteries of God. I am to steward the Word of God, the Bible, the doctrine, the teaching. There are a lot of churches, they are so caught up in meeting needs with people that are surface that they don't preach the Word of God anymore. And guys, part of my job description is not only to be a slave to Christ, but to be a steward of the mysteries of God in His church. To protect them, to say what is off limits, you cannot bring the world's philosophy on sexuality into the church and tell me what that Bible says about it. You can't mix this stuff and tell me that what that is out there in that culture trumps or is better or should be considered when it comes to the Bible. I'm telling you right now, this church and that culture outside are two ships passing in the night. Does not mean that I don't love people. I love them enough to tell them the truth. I'm going to get myself in all kinds of trouble in the years to come. Praise God, but I'm going to be a fool for Christ doing it. And I don't have anything but this word. I am a steward of it. There will never be a day, and I declare it over my life in front of all you people. And somebody take me out in the woods and shoot me if there is. Praise God. But there will never be a day when those Jesus booster rockets fall off of John Lee and I go into outer space and I'm on Oprah Winfrey and I'm just kind of, you know, we're all just in one deal and we're just all trying and blah, blah, blah. That's not happening, man. There is one meteor between God and man. That's Jesus Christ. And there is only one sacrifice. And according to the standard of God, you come to God, not your standards. You are... You are not to make idols and worship them. You are, to, you are the fingerprint of God. You better get to knowing Him. Amen. He's in control, not you. Who got the sun up this morning? You can't even balance your checkbook, but you're telling me that you got ideas on how, to, how you know God. Shame on you. I'm here as a servant of Christ and not... A servant of this world. You go serve money, I serve Jesus. If you consider me, this is who I am if I'm genuine. And there are stewards of the mysteries of God. I'm here to defend the faith, to be loyal to it, all the way to the end. And just to serve it on Sunday morning. Just to say, here's what it says. The Word says that we are to rightly divide the Word of truth. And the word rightly divide is an orthopedic word. It's the word we get orthopedic in the Greek from. And it means, you know, we get orthodontry to have straight teeth. And you need preachers that can define terms and have context and give the best meaning they can of the text in order for you to have straight theology. And this word, uh, I, I can't remember it fully, it's ortho something. It, it, it speaks to shooting straight with the people what is on the page. And if I get up here and I just fangle what is clear in that passage, you know that I'm not shooting straight with you. 
But if I'm giving the best meaning and I'm shooting straight, then you got yourself a preacher. And that's the kind of preacher we need today. Not one who deceitfully handles the Word of God in a mishmash of taking things out of context and kind of putting it in because that's what people want to hear. I am not here for you. I'm here for Him. Ultimately. So that I can be here for you. And if you've come just to hear me preach, you, have, you don't get me at all. Amen. All right. Happy time. Let's go to the next point. All right, Dennity. If you want to be big and mighty in the church, learn how to go down there and row at the bottom of the ship. And wish for your best reward to not be a burden to people in the church, but a blessing. And be a steward of what God has put in your hands. Let me say this last thing. As a steward, you don't own the mysteries of God. Some people come to church and say, ah, oh, I've heard all this a million times. I'm familiar with all of these things. John, you're not telling me anything I don't know. I wish we'd have some more stuff. But can I tell you that these are not your mysteries that you own? They are God's myster- mysteries that He owns. And you're to steward what's important to Him, not you. Some people, they say, oh, this passage is important to me, but I don't like these other passages. It's not your mysteries. You just pass out the peanuts. Let somebody else fly the plane, dag nabbit. Secondly, the identity is covered here of a genuine minister. And what is the requirement? Moreover, the word moreover in the Greek is the word loipon. It means the remnant. What's left over. The rest. Or what's from this time forth. And I believe what Paul is saying in this word moreover. Our whole day is before moreover or loipon. It means in this case, in this scenario, moreover. We've had the circus. We've had big shot preachers, big shot ministers known for their giftings and modes of persuasion. But from this time forward, it is required that a steward be found faithful. With what is left of us, let those people be found faithful. It's not John Lee's church. He just preaches there and stewards the word of God there. This is Christ's church. These are Christ's people. You're serving people that don't belong to you. They belong to God. Be found faithful. Zeteo in the Greek. uh, To be required. This is what is to be sought after in the church. For stewards. They're just faithful. How many of you... uh, if you were the boss of a company, you'd want faithful employees. And the word faithful in the Greek is the word simply trustworthy. Trustworthy. How many of you want to be trustworthy people? How many of you want to be trustworthy? Not just somebody with an opinion on TikTok or, uh, or Facebook. Everybody's, oh, I have a mouth, I can speak. But, but, but also just trustworthy. That's what's required. It's not an option. This is what is absolutely mandatory when it comes to leadership in the church. They have to be faithful. How can you be faithful if you're not disciplined? You say, oh, you're getting into legalism, John Lee. No, I'm just saying maybe we could grow up a little bit this year. Be less selfish, less lazy, and more show up. Some of you know the world would be a better place if they had more faithful people in it. Just faithful. Just steady. Just consistent. Just there. We need this in stewards of the house. We need faithful people. God is not measuring my rewards as John Lee based upon outward success. Based upon numbers. Based upon people liking me or disliking me. The one thing He is going to judge me on at the end of the day is faithfulness. That's it. 
Were you just, were you faithful? There have been times in this ministry where I'm like, Lord, I don't know which end is up. I remember one time it was real bad, and I was angry because nobody showed up for Easter Sunday. This was a while back. I mean, people showed up like 15 minutes late to Easter, and I'm having a meltdown. And I get past that Easter, and the Lord just speaks to me. So I just want you faithful, man. Just be faithful. Because I'm putting down ambition in you. I'm putting this stuff down, and I'm just making you my guy so that you'll have longevity of ministry because it won't be about who likes you. But if you do it for Christ. Amen? How many of you don't want to get tripped up this year because of some crazy, selfish person? That just made you crazy and selfish too. Man, I'm not following that. I follow him. What is required of you, man of God, woman of God? Be trustworthy. Be loyal to the faith. And the word here, eureka, or to find. That you're so busy being faithful that you're not worried about promotion. You're not worried about this. And God comes and just finds you and says, now, you've been faithful in this little thing. Now I'm going to raise you up to be faithful over much. You remember David out in the field with his sheep and all of his brothers had come in to be anointed by Samuel. And they're all standing there. Who's getting the promotion? Who's getting the promotion? And David's away from the whole scene in obscurity, just taking care of what is his responsibility. And God sends for him because God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but looks at the heart. And he just says, that's the guy that I can use. The guy when nobody was praising him and just taking care of sheep. And he risked his life with a barren lion for the little sheep. Who's that guy? Find me him. My eyes search to and fro across the earth to find one man who'll stand in the gap. While everybody else is moved by the bells and whistles of life, how many more movies do we have to go through? And I tell you people, people will compare ministers to ministers, and some of them are really good ministers. Who do you like better? And I tell you, when people get upset with me in the church, they go, well, I, it's like almost clockwork. This is not the way we did it in my last church. And why did you leave that last church? Your pastor's waiting for you. Revelation time, go home. He's calling for you. You've been praying you back home. We did this different in the 80s. You know, let me talk to you. Because he's going to say, he's going to say here, it's a small thing that I'd be judged by your human court. And what's he talking about? He's talking about human criteria that's above the word of God on what a minister should be. And there'll be people come in this church. They say, we are to dress up in church. People are to have a tie on, a suit on. People are to dress up in honor of God. And look, if you want to dress up, I think that you should have deodorant on. And I think that you should like not smell like camphophonique. And I... And come on in this house, all right? And put a breath mint in, okay? Because the spirit of halitosis is real. Amen. But I just got, oh, I'm honorary today. I love how I am. Glory to God. I don't care. I just got back from, I just got back from Spain and I went into some of these Catholic churches and beautiful churches, but they had the priest's garb behind stained glass of some guy that died. It's got their big old bonnet. And it's got all their garb and then it had their undergarbs and they just, oh, this is so amazing. And then I had this one guy one time that come up to me and he says, John, we always wear a tie when we go to church. It was the early 2000s. And man, it wasn't two months later I find out he's cheating on his wife. And I think the Bible doesn't speak to dressing up. I think it speaks to uh, modesty and that you're not dragged attracting attention to yourself one way or the other that you look presentable but that you're known more by what's on the inside than what's on the outside that's the message and how you and i asked the guy that told me to wear a tie dag but he had an oiled old nasty mustache telling me to wear a tie i'm the preacher get on down the road to your high church 
running around on his running around on his wife. I said, "Well, what do you go to bed in at night? Do you? I I want to know how you're living the rest of your life. I don't care if you wear a suit into church and that's how you honor God with it. But I I care more about what's going on in your house and how you're treating your wife and your your kids and if you're living selfishly or you've grown up to the point where you've become a slave of Christ. I'm just saying there's some things that take the back seat to others and don't let the others drive the car and put Jesus crucified in the back seat while we celebrate our gifts more than we do the gift that unifies us. So what is the requirement of these slaves and these stewards? Man, be found. I had a guy the other day say, oh, I just can't wait till Jesus comes. I'm so tired of the politics in this world. I'm just set on ready for Jesus to come. And the Bible says that we are to anticipate it and look forward to it. But I think some people just want an escape. Just get me out of this horrible place. Are you faithful to what God has given you? Or are you blaming society for you wanting to run? Brothers and sisters, we are to occupy until He comes. And we are to be found faithful. And let Him give the increase and do whatever He wants to in this church. But my laser focus is slaving and stewarding and being faithful. And then lastly, our attitude. How many of you know we all need a good attitude when it comes to being God's people? He says in verse 3, But it is a small, very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I know nothing against myself. And yet I'm not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart then each one will get their praise from God. Our attitude. He says that Christ will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. The word counsel is the word boule in the Greek. It is the word will or purpose or hidden agendas or motives of the heart. How many of you believe that our motives are as important as what we do? And Paul says, it's a very small thing that you judge me. I'm Apostle Paul, and y'all just got saved. I've planted churches everywhere, and y'all are telling everybody that Paul's not as good as Apollos. Wow, wow. (laughs) But he says, the word, and and in the Greek, the word anakrino is the word to judge. It, It is not just krino, which is judge not lest you be judged, Matthew 7, 1. But anacrino means to size somebody up. Ana, up, judge them all the way up. It is a small thing, he says, that you size me up. And it, it is a hypercritical judgment. Where there's a hypercriticalness that gets in the church, where we start to play God with people's lives. He says, it's a small thing that you examine me the, the word means to examine with torture. Have you ever been examined with torture by somebody who is hypercritical of you? Just like, oh my goodness, get me through this. It's a very small thing to me. And as a pastor, boy, if I could just get to the place where it doesn't matter nearly as much to me what people think about me as to what God thinks about me. It's a very small thing to me that Because I love it when people say, oh, that was a great word. But I heard some things that were not happy about me this week. And I'm looking out the window while it's being told to me what somebody has said. And it wasn't me personally, just people in the church that people are upset with. I'm looking out the window and I said, you know, people that are less committed are more likely to complain than people that are. People that are more about just serving and keeping their head down and loving Jesus and staying in their lane are a lot less likely to complain than hooper, 
uh, anacrino, opinionated people who have done nothing. And there are some people that say, I've been in this church for a year. Well, brother, have you been in this church for 13 years? Oh, I feel a little, I feel it a little bit. All right. (laughs) What time have you put in? In serving. Versus sizing people up and coming to church to do that. There's only one judge, the Bible says, and that's Christ. And He will judge accurately on that day. And every one of us will stand before Him and give an account for our life. And some of us will have wood, hay, and stubble, and the others... Pure gold, silver, and precious stones. And that's what's to be our motivation, not to come to church to size people up. We are to be discerning, but we are not to usher a verdict on people. It's a very small thing that you pass verdict on me, he says. He says, I don't even judge myself. He says, I don't, I'm not aware of anything I'm doing wrong in my conscience, and I think that's important that you keep a clean conscience. He says, but that doesn't even justify me because the Lord is my judge. He says, I don't even judge myself. How many of you know people have bias when they judge you? They're coming from their point of view, right? How many of you know that you have bias when you judge yourself? Some of you think too well of yourselves. You're waiting. Lord, help me. I'm just trying to preach this passage. You're waiting for people to discover you. If they only knew who I was in God. And you may be something seriously awesome in God that nobody has discovered. Like Joseph who told his dream to his brothers and they didn't take it well. And yet Joseph was proud and he had to be humbled through serving. Go serve at Potiphar's house for a while. Go serve at the prison for a while. And I'll send for you when you're ready. How many of you know you've said it to God at times before? I'm ready. And he said, no, you're not. I've been patient. No, you haven't. It's my time. No, it's not. Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves and God's our judge and in his timing, he's grooming us and raising us. Sometimes we think too low of ourselves. Sometimes we condemn our hearts. But the Bible says if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. Your value system starts with him and who you are is with him. He's the judge of your life, not your opinion of yourself or people's opinion of yourself. I think it's important to keep your nose clean and your conscience clear, yes. But ultimately, God is your judge, not man. He says, therefore, don't judge anything before the time. God will bring out the hidden things of darkness. You know, He'll take care of His house. And if there's squarely business going on, God will see too, bringing it to light. How many of you know that's true? You don't have to go police everything to keep Him from doing that. The Bible does say that we are to Judge ourselves that we don't be condemned with the world. We examine ourselves, but do so with the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us and trusting that He's pointing things out in our life, our conscience. But none of us have arrived to the place where we are judged. Stop judging each other. Stop passing judgment on each other. You may have a discerning spirit about something or a burden and go talk to that person. But even then, that's somebody... Who are you to judge another uh, man's servant, the Bible says? Who are you? Nobody. I'm a slave. I'm a steward. I'm to be faithful. And I'm not to judge. You know, the Bible says, what's John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's the next verse? For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus has not sent us to condemn everybody. To bring people in long enough to really hyper-criticize them. We're here to get people restored. We're here to put hope into the hearts of sinners. Because our God has saved us from such wretchedness. How many of you have been saved from stuff? And you didn't deserve it. And God did it anyway. And, And with that love and compassion, we're to bring that to the church instead of going, now let's work on so and so. Ha, 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 ha. You get that gossip, hypercritical stuff out of you. 
That stuff has to be destroyed. God will take care of everything. And you just seek people's best, man. You just go after their very best. Keep counseling, keep loving them, and, and, and it's the spirit behind it that is a spirit of redemption, not of being a Pharisee who's critical of everything and missing the whole boat of why Jesus came. How many of you have ever been a little too critical? And, it, and, and you, how many of you don't want to be so critical this year that you go by a prepper shack someplace? and know everything about A to Z, and never step foot in the church again. I, I need us all here. Team Jesus. And serving peanuts on the plane he's flying. Amen? Let's have our attitude right this year. Let's do it unto him, and love people, and let God do the work. How many of you have grown up a little bit in the Lord to where what people say about you just doesn't affect you the way it used to? Can I, you feel like you've made some progress where it used to just break your heart and you're like, oh, and now you're like, oh, cool. As long as my wife and my dogs love me. How many of you got a dog that still loves you? Or you got a God that loves you a whole lot more and sees you a certain way and he is for you and he is reasoning it to a conclusion and he has reckoned to you his righteousness and you're a friend of God and you don't have to worry about people sizing you up anymore. And you can't live under that if you're going to serve Christ. Amen. How many of you want to be genuine this year? How many of you want to have your identity in serving and loving others and serving Christ. How many of you want to be a steward of the truth and not preach something that just appeals to you on Sunday or Monday or whenever? How many of you want to be faithful? How many of you want to have a good attitude this year that says, I do this for Him and nobody else? Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Lord, I pray for the ministry here. And I pray for uh, the sincere hearts that have come into this house, Lord God, the elders and the leaders here, Father, that you keep this church, Lord. It's the apple of your eye and flourishing, Lord God. And I just ask you to keep me from being hypercritical this year. Keep me, Lord God, as a faithful man to my wife. Lord, help me. Help the leadership here be blameless. Help me to be faithful to you in the secret place of my life when nobody's looking. Help me to be transparent. Lord, I look to you for it all because I know what I am without you. Nothing. And I give you such praise, Lord God, for what is left and the remnant here that is faithful. Thank you for my mom. And for all those that have come, I like, I like Paul Amos a lot. He's faithful and he loves his wife. And he's my friend and I love him. And he's hungry and he's got childlike faith. Lord, I pray that it just exudes in this church. Make us good business, Lord. And Lord, I do kneel before you and ask you for these things. Because I know, Lord God, you don't owe me anything. But I thank you, Lord God, for your great grace that continues to flow to my life based upon who you are. Put your hand over your heart this morning. Thank you, Ryan, for those kind words. Father, how many of you today just want to grow in your faithfulness this year to your family? How many of you say, John, I, I just want to be a faith. I don't need to be talented or skilled I, or clever or glib or the funniest person in the room. I just want to be faithful. How many of you could grow in that this year? You need, you're asking God, make me a faithful steward, trustworthy. Amen. Father, I just pray today over every heart in this place. I pray for trustworthiness over marriages, Lord God. 
and trustworthiness, Lord, in this house, O oh God. And this be the year, Lord Jesus, that you establish this work in such a great way, Holy Spirit of God. You're bringing them in. And I give you the praise for it today, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise this morning and an honor to Him. We're going to open up the altars this morning for prayer. If you need prayer uh, for healing or anything going on in your life, please come on up. And if you're new, come say hi to me today over in the site. But let me say one more thing and we're done. If there's any, look at me. If there's anybody in this place that is doing life on your own and you don't know Jesus Christ personally, today is the day. I want you to come down here and pray with us and ask Jesus to come live in your heart and change your life forever. You will never be the same with Christ in your life. He is closer than a brother and he is real. His power will break chains off of your life. So that you're a fool for God instead of being a fool for everything in this world. And God will change your life. And he'll promise you a happy ending to your life. And you'll be a miracle and not a tragedy because of Christ. That's what he does best. Amen. Amen. Father, be with my friends today, Lord. Help us to leave this place set on serving, set on faithfulness, and our attitude, Lord God, to be set on you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. 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 And God bless you today. Amen. Thank you.